uh, yes, I'm now in Japan, uh, so eating lots of rice. It's all very nice. Uh, so I'll be talking about magnetic quantum engineering. So um, let's see if this works. No, it doesn't. There we go. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about using uh, magnetic fields to manipulate and control quantum systems. And as uh, Sugato mentioned, I've been interested in this for about, I don't know, eight, nine years. So before that, we were doing a bit of optomechanics, which is quite well developed now. So uh, that might have a few disadvantages. So we switched to magneto quantum mechanics. And that is a kind of field which is growing. A lot of people are getting into it, doing nice experiments, nice theory. So we'll talk a little bit about what we've been doing. So uh, the nice thing about motional quantum systems, mechanical quantum systems, as, it, as opposed to spin, and that mechanics can do all sorts of things. And, and it's a way of perhaps getting to macroscopic quantum systems, macroscopic quantum effects. And uh, photonics is quite well developed. You can have all sorts of quantum systems using high quantum, high Q photonic cavity, cav cavities and waveguides and switches. So uh, we're interested to see if we can get high Q mechanical systems. So they could be used for sensors, for pre preparing macroscopic quantum superpositions. And the idea for magnetic forces is that they're quite passive. So sometimes you can have quite passive magnetic forces and that might lead to lower noise. So I typically split my talks into four little talks and to get more uh, bang for your buck. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, our initial theory for uh, levitation and cooling of a small superconducting cage. Uh, then a little talk about um, experiments to, to trap little diamonds magnetically. Then some recent stuff on uh, looking at um, detecting whether space-time itself can be in a microscopic superposition. Mm. Then in the end, uh, I'll spend a bit of time for quantum sensing because part of the motivation to make a magnetic quantum engineered system is to build sensors. So can we go past the Heisenberg scaling for quantum sensing? So the first one is a bit of an old work. So this is our theory on, on, on developing quantum trapped systems using magnetic forces. So uh, we want to get high Q mechanical resonators and there's a whole bunch of reasons for doing that. But one is of course from fundamental science, can you have large macroscopic superpositions? Uh, and then for sensors, can you, uh, mechanical systems can feel all sorts of forces. Can we use those for, for, for sensing? And also mechanical systems can be used as a toolbox to mm. all sorts of different systems together. And so uh, for the fundamental science part is again, we want large microscopic su superpositions. And here's, I think your first talk was by Marcus Arndt. So you've probably heard all about these hairy molecules getting into quantum superpositions. And uh, the, I'll talk a little bit about this spin entanglement witness later on. And sensors, I've never heard of a octogram, but I guess it's 20, 10 to the minus 24 of a gram. So yeah, maybe we can sense very tiny masses. And quantum toolboxes can be used to couple microwaves or spins together using mechanical degrees of freedom. So having mechanical systems are pretty handy from all sorts of reasons. But for to do this, we'd like to have as little damping as possible. So we want a high as Q factor as possible and a high mechanical frequency to cool it. So one idea is to use superconducting systems because they already have very low levels of electronic dissipation. And we use this for a levitated low dissipation mechanical resonator. And so a little movie I like to show is this one. Let's see if I can get this to work. This is where we're putting a magnet down a copper tube. So the copper tube, it's not magnetic, but you notice the magnet falls very slowly down the copper tube. And here's an aluminum tube, very slowly down the aluminum tube. And that's due to eddy currents. And essentially it's because uh, the motion of the magnet causes through Lenz's law, the generation of eddy currents, which opposes its motion. So let's have a, a, a look at, uh, no, how do I get out of this? Come on, come on. 
Um, so let's have a look at this example where I have, I'm looking at a, a, a wire ring or a loop and it's going to in the horizontal, in the vertical plane and uh, above a certain height, there's a magnetic field, which is coming out of the paper here. And below that height, there's no magnetic field. And so what I'll do is I'll let this loop fall. Now, as it falls, it'll the magnetic flux through this loop will change because there's no magnetic flux down here. So Lenz's law will essentially say EMS will be and currents will be set up in the loop to essentially stop it falling. And here's the here's the equation of motion that you get now. There's a double derivative in velocity, um, and there's some damping due to uh, the resistance in the wire. But there's also a, an oscillator term which is related to the anisotropy of the magnetic field and also the uh, inductance. And gravity is trying to cause it to fall. So if I let this thing fall, then here's the height as a function of time. It falls and it oscillates. But eventually, due to the resistance, the oscillation stops and it just falls. These oscillations are essentially trying to stop it falling. If I look at a loop of smaller resistance, I get larger oscillations and it slowly falls. So if I now go to the limit of no resistance, it just oscillates and it doesn't fall. So uh, that's just a simple toy model. Um, it's just a, plain, a planar uh, loop in the vertical direction. So if we want complete stability, let's look at a uh, uh, loops, three loops in three directions, three dimensions. So this is the type of cage we considered, three interlocking loops which aren't electrically connected. And we position that next to a small magnet, so which produces a very anisotropic magnetic field, inhomogeneous magnetic field. And so just as we had that uh, the previous slide, if this little cage tries to move in any direction, uh, the flux threading the, the loops will change and it won't want to do that. And so it's restored and you can work out the oscillation frequency and you can work out the um, in the, the various directions as a function of the size of this cage. And as you can see, as you get large, the uh, there's not much change here. It, this is about a megahertz here, six, this is log base 10. So for very small, you can get very large oscillation frequencies, but it doesn't change very much make this cage very much larger. And so, yeah, so if you put that little cage there, it'll just stay there and it'll oscillate. But it'll damp, and it'll damp due to a number of, uh, of factors. One is if we make this out of type two superconductor, the, uh, the flux lines can slowly get through the superconductor. That's uh, called flux dragging. Also, is as it moves around, it can induce eddy currents in this magnet, which is a conductor. But if we make the magnet out of an insulator, which is yttrium iron garnet, then yeah, it can't really make uh, eddy currents there. But the main source of, of damping is due to the background gas. So we have to have an ultra high vacuum. And you can essentially estimate the motional Q left if we have ultra high vacuum, which yeah, is really low pressure, and we can estimate the motional Q to be around 10 to the nine, which is pretty high. So we went through the theory of that. So this is the little picture. So what's this guy down here? It's a flux qubit. So why have we got that there? Well, to actually get it to the ground state, we have to cool the center of mass. And to cool it, what we propose doing is we couple it inductively to this flux qubit. So this sigma Z is the state of the flux qubit. This A plus A dagger is the height of this cage. And you can work out the coupling strength and it's not small. So with that, there are coupling of the harmonic oscillator to this two level system. There are pretty well known ways of cooling the harmonic oscillator. And in this case, the flux qubit is a bad flux qubit. It decays pretty quickly. And so essentially we can essentially um, go to the anti-stoke sideband and remove the phonons. And when we do that, we can cool this motion, this cage down to eh, one phonon or two phonons from a low temperature. So this flux qubit is acting as a sort of a refrigerator and we're cooling the motion of this. So they published this back in 2012 and uh, Romeo uh, is art, uh, Aurel also published something quite similar. So that's uh, our initial forays into magneto mechanics. So after that, we had a look at uh, changing this flux qubit to be a very good flux qubit. 
And then you can actually uh, impart forces onto this little floaty ring here, which is a yellow ring. And we can uh, also make a superposition of forces. So with that, we can actually do matter interferometry. And the phase accrued is just due to the local acceleration of gravity. And from that, we can measure gravity. Or briefly, we could then put some spins into this kind of levitated thing. And uh, we can then couple the spins to the motion and we can squeeze all of the spins and we can get large spin squeezing. So I'm just briefly jumping over these works. I won't go into them in any, any big detail. Or we can couple two harmonic oscillators. This one here is a, a magnet on a spring coupled to an LC circuit. And these are coupled only when the magnet moves. So this coupling is velocity coupling. It's a bit of a weird type of coupling. It's in optomechanics, you have position uh, photon number coupling here. This is position uh, velocity coupling. So it's a bit of a strange one. So these are with colleagues in Australia. So uh, that was our initial foray into magneto mechanics, quantum magneto mechanics. Then we went and tried to do some experiments. So let's tell you a little bit about those. So we wanted to actually try some levitated quantum mechanics, uh, eventually to try to make you know, Schrodinger cats. Um, and again, there's a whole host of different reasons to do that. We want to make ultra high quantum mechanical oscillators, maybe as a sensor, and people are now proposing to use this as a sensor to detect dark matter, maybe to make a macroscopic superposition or to perhaps explore how, how uh, gravity in, uh, interacts with quantum mechanics. So there's a whole, whole zoo of different ways of trying to do this. Some people are trying to levitate a, a very large mirror optically that uses large laser powers. Then there's a, a lot of people are using tweezers, optical tweezers. Again, that uses large laser powers. People are using electrodynamic pole traps. So, and other people are looking at hanging mirrors on long optical fibers. So that's like a small cantilever. It's not exactly levitated, but it has very low damping. So we decided to do magnetic levitation. And here's a, a from this old paper where they've levitated a, a live frog inside the bore of an a, a NMR magnet. Okay, so that's what we we're looking at. But going back over the optical tweezer trap, yeah, it's a pretty well developed technology. People have trapped diamonds and also silicon dioxide, silica particles. And essentially uh, the particle is attracted to the maximum of the focus. And people have made dumbbells, which and ro rotated up to gigahertz and have also trapped NV centers in diamond and seen the NV emission in the optically trapped diamond. But we wanted to go through the uh, essentially uh, the magnetic route and here's a, a graph of uh, essentially what people have achieved without feedback cooling on the particle. So uh, various pressures, they noticed uh, where you can essentially get, so the vertical axis is the trapping frequency and the horizontal axis is, is the pressures people have, have achieved. And the problem is that as you get to lower and lower pressures, the damping reduces and reduces and sometimes quite often you lose the particle because you can't really keep the uh, the center of mass kinetic energy controlled. So the blue dots are for the diamond particles and the, the orange dots are for the silicon particles. So essentially we want to go down here. We want to get to very low pressures and very high center of mass frequency so we can cool to close to the ground state. And if we get to very low pre pressures, we hopefully will get very large Qs. So we were going to use uh, magnetic trapping and this is diamagnetic trapping. And so if I have a particle with a magnetic susceptibility chi in a magnetic field, it experiences this acceleration. And if you vary the magnetic field linearly, say along the Z axis, then you end up with a an acceleration which is linear in Z and whose sign is proportional to the susceptibility. So for diamagnets, this is negative and you essentially have a harmonic oscillator. So typically the, this magnetic susceptibility is very tiny. So we have to compensate for that to get very, to get appreciable trapping frequencies. To do that, we have to have a very large gradient magnetic field. So we tried to do that 
by having very large permanent magnets very close together. So there are two North Poles, which are extremely close together. And we are able to get very large gradient fields, 10 to the 5 tests per meter. And that gave us a, a pretty decent, well, not very large compared to optical traps, uh, vertical, uh, vertical frequency, trapping frequency, and horizontal trapping frequency is half that. Graphite is about mm, three or four times higher. So uh, that was done with colleagues in Australia. So essentially, we uh, had tiny little magnets. And uh, we uh, sharpened the edge at ends of them, put them very close together in a small vacuum chamber. Then we had light illuminate that. And we trapped a little diamond. And here's a picture of it. And here's a little diamond. And what we did with the optics, we imaged that diamond through a microscope. And then we split the top half of the light of this little ring here. This disk went to one photodiode, and the bottom half went to another photodiode. And then we are able to essentially subtract the signals from the photodiodes, and that would give us an indication of the height at pretty high bandwidth. So we could track the height, and uh, at atmosphere, it really didn't move. It's highly damped in atmosphere. And, um, but as we trap, as we remove the air, we get to higher vacuums, uh, it moved a lot. And if it moved too much, it's lost. It's, the trap is only so deep. Um, so th that's, that's what we had to look at. There's quite pretty good theory behind all this. It's essentially um, Brownian motion in a harmonic trap. So here's your stochastic differential equation for the damped harmonic motion with a trap. And you can work out in theory the uh, power spectral density and also the uh, mean squared displacement. And this was done back in 2010 for an optically trapped particle by Tonkan Lee and Mark Raisin, Texas. And they got beautiful agreement between theory and experiment. So we tried to do that for the particle, which is the little diamond trapped in the magnetic trap. And at high pressure, sorry, at high pressure, you don't see much of any resonance at all. That's not the trap. So, but the theory pretty much agreed with the experiment. But if you reduce the pressure, you could start to see the trap appear around 400 hertz. And at much lower pressure, yeah, we definitely could see the trap. And we could pull out the trapping frequencies. And the particle definitely heated up. Um, we had a bit of light there to illuminate the particle, and it heated up. And if we went to very low pressures, we could get a very sharp uh, peak, but it came that we see definitely see some anharmonicity in the trap. So there was some anharmonic effects happening at these low pressures. So uh, we got down, so we didn't have any feedback cooling or anything in the particle here, but, uh, and we could keep the particle, it didn't escape, because a lot of other particles, when you had laser, laser trapping, they got very, very hot, and then they would get too much kinetic energy and they would be lost to the trap. So our particle heated up, but it didn't get that hot, so we could keep it. So we got down to 10 to the minus 6 tor. But if we could get to much lower pressures and keep the particle, we could get to much higher Q. So that was back in 2019. Yeah, so next would be to try with some sort of feedback cooling and to improve the vibration isolation because we noticed on these curves, there's definitely at low pressures, there's some low, there's some white noise coming from somewhere, from low frequency noise. Okay, so that was the second little story. So the third story is how to detect gravitational entanglement using perhaps rotation. So this is kind of work almost finished, it's sort of in progress. So. So can me gravity mediate entanglement? So can space-time itself be put into a quantum superposition? So this nice paper by Sukato and colleagues here who are listening. Can the gravitational force be used to entangle massive objects? So back then, you had to look at two, NV, two nanodiamonds, which you put into a superposition of two positions. And in the superposition, there are two configurations which are much closer than the others. And so you get a gravitational phase shift building up between these two configurations. 
which then are mapped into the NV centers. And so you can read out the potential entanglement with the NV centers at the end. So these use translational superpositions. So we were looking at rotational superpositions. Can we do something similar using rotation? So this is where Jing Mei, who's now just moved to Cork as of last week in Dublin and in Ireland, and Thomas Bush, who's here. So we wanted to look at a Cavendish type super uh, situation. So remember in the original Cavendish experiment, you had torsional balance, two big masses suspended by a tiny fiber. And there's a bit of a rotation when you bring bigger masses closer to these suspended pendulum, torsional pendulum. And so the, uh, the, this torsion balance twisted and had different rotational dynamics when you brought these heavy fixed masses next to them. So what we were considering is two coaxial Cavendish pendulum. So let's imagine instead of one of these guys, you had two of them and they were coaxial. So here's these blue guy and this blue guy, and they're at two different angles. So let's imagine I somehow can put both of these into angular superpositions. So let's do that somehow. So there we have the red superpositions and the green superpositions. And you can see we have a similar arrangement. The red ones are closer than the green ones. So the red ones will have build up a bigger gravitational phase than the other parts of the superposition. So if we have the original pendulum, they get split into equal superpositions, angular superpositions. And after gravity acts, you get a buildup of all these gravitational phases. The red-green ones are the same because they're, they're about the same distance apart. The red, one, red ones are closer, so they'll build up bigger phases. And you can estimate how big these phases are. And it's curious for small balls, let's imagine these rods are massless, but we have balls at the end here. For small balls of say lead, which are only that in radius, yeah, uh, and the angle here phi is pi over 15, yeah, for only a small splitting of 0.2 of a milliradian, you can get a pi phase shift on this last term. So it's kind of interesting how big these phases accrue. And that's in a short amount of time. I can't remember the time, but uh, I can look it up. So yeah, you don't have to have very big pendula to get this relative phase to build up to an entangled state. So the problem is, how do you actually make an entangled superposition? So how do you make a splitting of the torsional pendulum? in a controlled way. So back here, the whole point is we needed to be able to split this blue guy into the red and the green guy in angle. And if we can split it by only a few degrees, hardly anything at all, we can perhaps get some gravitational entanglement building up. So the question is, how do we get uh, a superposition of angles in a torsional pendulum in a controlled way? Okay. So to do that, we had a look at a superconducting ring. If we have a superconducting ring and we thread it with a magnetic field, there is a torque on it. So let's have a look at that system. So here is the Hamiltonian of, uh, of the angle, angular dynamics of a ring, which can be rotating around this direction, sort of out, out of the board, uh, which is threaded with a magnetic field. So if there's no magnetic field, here's the part of the Hamiltonian, which is quite nonlinear. Uh, if there's no magnetic field, then there's just a harmonic oscillator potential. And that's that blue one here. But if you put on a magnetic field and ramp up the magnetic field, and you, here's the magnetic flux quantum, and here's the, um, the inductance. So uh, you get a double well potential. So, uh, and it's at pretty big angles, essentially one radian. So if you can uh, essentially move from smoothly from this blue curve, which is the harmonic oscillator, which is just a, the ground state of that is just a localized Gaussian, to the ground state of the double well, well then that's a, that's a superposition, an angle, pretty distant, plus or minus one radian. Jason, if I may and ask that, a question, if I yep. may ask. So if you go to one slide before, so it's quite interesting. 
and the one where we're talking about the spin. But uh, I, I guess uh, you should okay. have uh, you should get a suppression of one over L cube. And I'm I'm a bit confused. Maybe your next slide when you were showing your uh, uh, yeah. Uh, you looked into the entanglement phase. Yes, exactly. So how are you getting one over L? It's, in, it's a rotation. It's L, L is the, this is the length of the pendulum. You see that if, uh, if it, uh, you know, like if it, uh, Earth and Moon rotates, it's just the, you, you would get the effect which will be proportional to one over R cube, not one over L. So that's what confuses me a bit. Oh, okay. And that will be hugely suppressed. So I do not know what L yeah. here is actually. So, but maybe L here is this tiny, maybe. it's pretty small. It's only on the scale of about 60 microns. No, no, what I'm saying is uh, the effect will be entanglement phase will be highly suppressed. So, but anyway, we can talk later on about this. Yeah, yeah, we can talk later on. So the question is how to get a superposition of pendulum. Um, so, if we could go from the ground state of this harmonic oscillator to the ground state of the double well, yeah, we can make a superposition of this ring in two different angles. That would be a massive superposition because it would be plus or minus pi, which is a very big difference in the angular superposition of the ring. The problem is, is that as you smoothly ramp this magnetic field B, it goes from this harmonic well through a very flat potential to the double well. So if you attempted to do adiabatic following, you would have to go infinitely slowly at this point where the well is completely flat. So it's not possible to adiabatically go from the ground state of this harmonic oscillator to the ground state of this double well. So what we tried is something known as a shortcut to adiabaticity. And that way you can uh, find a ramping of the magnetic field as a function of time that excites all sorts of motion, but you start in the ground state of the, 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 the single potential, the, the single well, and you end up in the ground state of the double well. So yeah, we found uh, such a uh, SDA and here is a numerical simulation. So here's what you can imagine you might want to do. You put this superconducting ring here on the, the suspension wire and you ramp a magnetic field through this ring, which would provide a superposition of torques for this pendulum. So here's the simulation for the toy model. Essentially, you start off in the ground state of the harmonic well, and as time goes along, you provide this SDA, boots it into a superposition, the ground state of, of the double well. Then at a certain time, we just apply a phase ramp just mimicking the application of the gravitational phases that are accrued. And then we reverse the SDA. And instead of coming back to this nice Gaussian, we end up in this um, shifted Gaussian. And here's perhaps what we get here, this blue curve. And this blue curve is highly sensitive to the phase ramp that you apply. If you apply no phase, you go back to the original. But if you apply a phase, you get this kind of meter which shifts around. So by measuring the, uh, the final angular distribution of this pendulum, just like you do in the Cavendish, you can see the gravitational phase, which is imprinted on the superposition. And people can measure phases, measure uh, angles down to femtoradian, which is much, much smaller than the, uh, the angles that you need to, uh, that, we, uh, that we calculate to, to have due to gravitational interference. So that's that small project. So hopefully this idea is to develop tiny co-axial Cavendish experiments to test for gravity mediated matter entanglement. So that's in preparation. Okay, so I have still some time left, do I? Jason, can I ask yep. on that part? Yep. Uh, your angle superposition, um, when we have superposition or anything, we don't have angular like operator, right? Yeah. Uh, so in, in here, it's just treated as a scene. Yeah. So, so your theta here is just a parameter or an, is it? Yeah, so it's just an angle. Yeah, it's not a parameter, it's an operator. Treat it as a C number. But we can still have uh, the 
the angular superposition state. Yep. Mm. Because when we have, so let's say, so, so superposition this, for position, yep. then we normally have some kind of a notion of uh, the, the position operator. Yes, yeah, so this is the, so we're treating the position as a continuous variable here. Hmm. But here you have, so, your, 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 uh, your thing is uh, the, uh, based on the angles. Yes, yeah, so I've, I'm not going into this debate about the commutator between P of theta and theta. I'm not yeah. doing that. P of theta, the commutator between P and theta and theta is I h bar here. The angles that we're going to be dealing with are milli radians. So it shouldn't okay. matter. If you're going okay. to go to much larger, yeah. Okay. So in this case, the toy model, yeah, these are very large angles. But in the actual applied, which I haven't shown you here, the actual physical simulation, we only have to split it by milli radians. Okay, so it's like a, a, a liberation uh, then. Yeah. Then uh, under that situation, so it's very tightly bound so yeah. that uh, you don't. Tiny, yeah. So here in the toy model, we're splitting by plus or minus one radian. Okay. So in the actual physical case, we're only going to be splitting by a, a milli radian. Okay. Yeah. Hello, I have a question also. Great. Uh, yeah. Uh, the entanglement, I understand that the entanglement that you do this in this double, uh, double bell potential is independent of uh, the mass of these, uh, these two particular dumbbells. But the, if uh, this uh, entanglement is modified by the gravity, then mass should be important. Yes, no, it's back here. So when you look at these phases, the mass of the objects come into the, to the, uh, to the phases. So the mass plays a, a, an important role in the phases that are accruing. And in this simulation here, we just put on by hand some phases to see how the phases would affect the matter interferometry of a single torsional pendulum. Okay. And uh, are the mass, I mean, uh, the, the, the instrument is enough, uh, enough uh, precise that uh, it can, it can, uh, it can uh, measure the very small variation uh, of entanglement for a very small uh, mass. This is the so, whole point. Yeah, so as, far as, uh, as far as the calculations go, um, the phases that you need to see an entangled state, um, yeah, these masses don't have to be that big. Pretty small masses will work. So in your usual Cavendish experiment, they're pretty big masses. We don't need anything as big as that. So if you have a look at this little ball here, so this ball only needs to be about 10 microns in diameter, which is very small. So we're talking about a microscopic Cavendish experiment, very small. And it would still be able to see these phases that are, are caused by an entangled state. How much variation do you, do you expect it to, be, uh, to be observable in your entanglement? Sorry, say uh, that again? Uh, how much variation with respect, for instance, uh, uh, consider so the, uh, I don't know, 50% uh, uh, maximum entanglement. Uh, how much have. variation by gravity should be, uh, should, should occur such that you can observe it? I don't know, 5%, 2%, no, 10%, I don't, I don't know. I don't know, we didn't calculate that. Oh, okay, thank you. Cool. So the last uh, quick talk, so I think I have about 10 minutes left, is uh, quantum sensing. So a lot of the, the work that we do is using quantum levitated systems to perform sensing. So let's have a look at how can we get better precision in sensing. So one of the big uh, applications of sensing is for magnetic fields. So here's just a, a variety of methods that people have used. So for squids, they can get down to 50 femtotesla per root hertz. You can use magne magnetomechanics where 
the actual resonator is deformed by magnetic fields. You can use uh, the Envy Center in Diamond to measure magnetic fields. You can use the Faraday, Faraday rotation effect to measure magnetic fields. And uh, essentially, this has lots of uses. So here's a magnetoencephalography machine, which is the usual one using squids surrounding a person's head. Here's, here's one where essentially we replaced it with atomic magnetometers. Essentially, here's a GPS, which is usually using satellites. Without satellites, you could perhaps navigate the world by knowing the magnetic map of the world and using a magnetometer to know where locally where you are. This is a vector magnetometer uh, to map yourself around the world by knowing the magnetic map of the world. Gravity also be great for sensing. So here's a uh, falling corner cube magnetometer, a gravimeter, use, which gets down to this level of precision. And in atomic gravimeters goes down another order of magnitude. And here's a, a portable one which is a very recent um, innovation. And so the actual atomic fountain is in, in here, the atomic, uh, and this is just ultra sensitive electronics and clocks. And you can use gravimetry to map all sorts of underwater stuff. Here's the flow of water under the continent of India using space-borne gravimetry. And here is the receding of the glaciers around Iceland due to using space-borne graph imagery. So it can tell you all sorts of things that usually very hard to sense. So for parameter estimation, they're always, it's always based in the following sort of manner. You prepare something, you prepare a quantum state that has in it, uh, you encode a particular parameter that you're trying to estimate. That parameter is now written into the quantum state and then you detect it and you repeat. And you build up statistics and you can estimate this parameter using all these statistics. And to get a good estimation, you would like the signal, that's I here, to change a lot with small changes in the parameter. So for instance, if you were looking at parameter based around here, the signal hardly changes with respect to the parameter. But if you're around here, there's a big change in the signal. So you can have uh, different levels of sensitivity or responsivity depending on how this transfer function changes. Here it changes like a sine wave. And there's whole different types of protocols. For instance, if I, here's a classical classical where I pre prepare a whole ensemble of identical quantum systems, each writing on each one the same type of parameter and you measure each one separately. Or you could have an entangled type measurement or you can have an entangled type preparation or you could do both. And people count the resources in different ways. You can count the total time, the number of probes used, or the number of repetitions. So here's an example of a good measurement. Here, the a small change in the parameter will make a big change in the uh, probability distribution and could easily resolve that small change in parameter. And here's a bad one. So there's very, very broad distribution and a small change in the parameter only produces a small change in the distribution and you wouldn't really be easily able to resolve the changed distribution. So uh, this is all built into something known as the quantum Fisher information and the Kramer rounds bound. So the uh, variance in measuring uh, a, a parameter, let's call it psi or, yeah, let's call it psi, is one over the square root of the number of trials and the Fisher information app. And this Fisher information has this mathematical form. So if you want to, this is given based on a particular probability distribution, which is based on a particular type of measurement. So if you know this probability distribution, you can work out this Fisher information. And using this probability distribution, it gives you this upper, the lower bound on the variance and the estimate of, of, uh, of psi. So if you want to go optimize this over all possible measurements, then you end up with the quantum efficient information. So over all possible measurements to get your best estimate of, of uh, psi, you again have this, but you now have to use this quantum efficient information. And it has a bit of a tough time if rho is mixed. So in the general definition, 
if I change this parameter a little bit, then I have a change in the density matrix and I work out the derivative of the density matrix. And I have to work out this operator L, which is known as the symmetric logarithmic derivative of, of, of this derivative of this change in the density matrix. And that's usually pretty hard to find if rho is mixed. But if the change in rho is given by a unitary matrix, which is generated by an operator G, then the measuring, uh, estimating this quantum Fisher information is actually pretty easy. And essentially it's the uh, uncertainty of the generator G in this state psi zero. So it's much easier to compute. But in the end, the uh, uncertainty is uh, the variance of the estimate is bounded above by the quantum Fisher information, F of Q. Okay, so that was quick single parameter estimation. So some examples, if I have a coherent state and I have a unitary rotation operator, which is generated by this number operator. So I have theta is gonna rotate this coherent state. Then uh, essentially I can work out the quantum Fisher information and it goes as alpha squared for this coherent state, which is like the, the average number in occupation of this coherent state. And so I can estimate the small rotation, um, the variance in the small angle theta, and it goes as one over the square root of n bar. So the further out this coherent state is, the better I can estimate this small angle of rotation. Can I do better? This is known as the standard quantum limit for this rotation angle. So I can do better if I have access to a squeeze state. So if I have a squeeze vacuum, then I look again at the action of this small rotation. And I can use this formula to work out the quantum Fisher information. And instead of going as n, it goes as n bar squared. So now, if I have access to a very large squeeze vacuum, I can estimate the rotation, the variance of the rotation. Sorry, this should be the, the delta of theta, not delta squared of theta, as one over n bar. So this is known as the Heisenberg limit of scaling for this parameter theta, the rotation angle. This shouldn't be squared, sorry. Can I do better? And you can. And this is if I have access to this guy, which is a nonlinear rotation. So if I have access to a nonlinear rotation, then I can estimate theta to uh, this delta theta should be as one over n bar to the three halves. So this is sometimes known as beyond the Heisenberg limit phase estimation. We're estimating this nonlinear phase. And this was suggested by Lewis back in 2004. Okay, so can you summarize? Um, if you're counting the resources as the occupation of this mode, then uh, if you have one over, if you're looking at the variance now, it goes as one over N. Uh, the Heisenberg goes as one over N squared. And if you can get faster than that, you get the super quantum scaling, super Heisenberg scaling. So what's been done experimentally? So there's been a lot of experiments attempting to uh, get towards Heisenberg scaling. Very few going beyond Heisenberg scaling. So this is a very recent uh, rev mod phys. And most of these experiments right on the Heisenberg scaling are ion trap experiments. That's here. They're not recent ones. Most of the ones that have very high metrological gain are neutral atom experiments. This is Kasevich, et cetera. These are very high squeezing experiments, but you don't see anywhere, any dots over here in the beyond Heisenberg limit. Only very few experiments have gotten there. So here's one example where people have looked at near Heisenberg scaling of uh, magnetic fields using a single NV center. And then there's a, quite a few using optics, using noon states in optics to get near Heisenberg scaling. But there's been only a few to try to get beyond Heisenberg scaling. And here's uh, work back in 2011, uh, where they, sh uh, they had uh, uh, light interacting with an atomic cloud. And they got slightly better than Heisenberg scaling in uh, the photon number of the beam. 
Here's a nonlinear interferometer, again, using a cloud of neutral atoms. And here we have a Max Zender interferometer where the final bean splitter is a nonlinear bean splitter. Um, and here they showed small improvement in the uh, scaling due to this nonlinearity. So there's only a few papers that have, have demonstrated a super Heisenberg scaling in precision. And they all rely on having nonlinear quantum operators. So these are usually very hard to do experimentally. So we thought, is there any way to craft such nonlinear operators from linear operators? Usually there isn't, but we're going to add into the game measurement. Sometimes measurement can effectively give you nonlinearities. So this is with uh, Matthias Johnson and colleagues who are now in uh, Melbourne and also at UNM. Is there any way to craft nonlinear Hamiltonians from linear ones so that you can achieve super Heisenberg scaling in precision? And what we're trying to do is go from a Hamiltonian that looks like this, a unitary that looks like this, e to the i theta n, where n is the rotation operator, to e to the i theta n squared. It's the same theta where you don't know theta. Is there any way to do this? So unitarily, it doesn't seem there is. So in the QFI, we saw that this type of generator just scales the QFI as n bar squared, but this, Q, this will scale the QFI as n bar cubed. So let's have a look as an aside at this integral. This is your normal Gaussian integral. And the interesting thing is you can, uh, uh, you can do this. The integral is well known. So the answer is here's B, you get B squared over 4A. That's just the Gaussian integral. But if you look at it again, you notice that on the left, B is appearing linearly, but on the right, it appears quadratically. So it's sort of what we're wanting up here where we've got N appearing linearly in the exponent and now it's quadratically in the exponent. So if we could somehow do this Gaussian integral, except replace all this, the stuff in the exponent with operators, yeah, maybe we could do this. So this is in this recent archive. So it's a bit of a, a circuit, quantum circuit that we're gonna show you now. So we have two optical modes or whatever, bosonic modes, it doesn't really matter. These are two bosonic modes. This top one we'll call the ancilla, which we're gonna measure. And the bottom one is the probe. So we've got a number of operations that we're gonna do on these two bosonic modes. We're gonna do squeezing, rotation. This one is a shear operation. And the last one here is a conditional rotation. So that's the operator here. We're gonna rotate the probe mode depending on the momentum of the ancilla mode. So how are we gonna get this integral happening? So the first thing is I'll, I'll show you what happens to this colored box. So I start off with a vacuum on the insula. I do a bit of squeezing and I do a bit of shearing. So the shearing in the momentum basis is this operator, e to the minus i beta p squared. And the squeezing, if I write it in the momentum basis, I can write as e to the minus p squared over two sigma squared. So now I'm writing the vacuum and these operators in the momentum basis and we have some quadratic integrals happening, e to the p squared. So now what I'll do is I'll consider this conditional rotation. And that conditional rotation is this one here, e to the minus igp times n. And when I do that in the momentum basis, I get this n, it's the operator acting on the probe that stays there, but the p now just becomes a number. But now if we look what's left in this integral, it looks exactly like what we have. We have a part which is p squared, which is y squared, and we have a linear part, which is p. And in the linear part, there's a prefactor, which is an operator. So I can do this quadratic integral. If, for instance, I measure the ancilla mode. When I measure the ancilla mode, I get an answer of position, say I measure the quadrature, the position quadrature, I get an answer M, then uh, I have to do this integral and I could do the integral exactly and I get this answer. And now I can see, now I have a quadratic operator N appearing 
And in the denominator, I've got some perhaps coefficients here with the, related to the squeezing and the shearing. And the answer M that I got from my measurement. So the answer M is random. And the exponent here is complex. There's a bit of real stuff. G is real. The squeezing is real, but this, this shearing is complex. So it's not exactly like I have over here, which is real. So uh, let's, let's see now if I know all the numbers here, essentially I've generated a Kerr operation on my, my, on my coherent state. So the coherent state was the initial state going into the probe. So if I break down this to a little bunch of operators that all commute, there are two operators which are unitary, which I've labeled in blue. Uh, that's here. And there's two operators which are non-unitary. So the unitary operators, there's a cur, which is a pure cur, which don't depend on the answer M. It's completely deterministic. There's a unitary which does depend on the answer M, which is random. Remember, it's the answer from the measurement. Uh, and it's a, just a rotation. And then the non-unitary ones, there's one which is deterministic and one which is random. Now, it turns out sigma squared, if we have infinite squeezing, sigma goes to infinity, and these, these non-unitary terms disappear. And I just end up with a unitary rotation which is non-unitary cur, uh, sorry, a bit of non-linear cur and a bit of random rotation. So for large or very large infinite squeezing, we almost get a pure state coming out, which has a bit of random rotation. But I know what that random rotation is, M. I know what the answer is, N, M is. And if I know all the other parameters here, I can remove that rotation. So I get a pure cur coming out. So if I know all the parameters, I can generate an almost pure curve. So the larger the squeezing, the better the curve, the more, more precise the protocol is. So what we did was we went through this and tried to generate a, a cat state. So if you operate a curve evolution on a, on a coherent state for long enough, you can get a pure cat. So that's the ideal answer, the cat that we want. But if we don't have much squeezing, we don't get a very good cat, but it's not too bad. But for much larger squeezing, we can get an almost perfect cat. And the same thing for a compass. A compass is when you have, uh, uh, essentially have a cur operating on a coherent state for another duration of time. Uh, and you get this nice pretty pattern, which is good for displacement sensing. It has very fine detail in the Wigner function. And with a little bit of squeezing, we get a not a very good approximation with, but larger squeezing, it's almost perfect. So that's, Essentially, we found a way of essentially making a cur, a cur rotation um, with, all, with a kind of measurement and cross gate here. Now, that's if we know all the parameters. But if we don't know some of the parameters, for instance, if we don't know what this beta is, what can we do? So if we go back to this circuit again, if we don't know what this rotation is, maybe we can use this circuit to estimate this rotation. So let's imagine we measure M and we do some correction and we look at the result of the probe. Can we look at the QFI on, on this circuit in stage five, the quantum Fisher information to estimate theta? So because there's measurement involved, there's a bit of a generalization of this quantum Fisher information to involve a bit of classical information, which is the probability distribution of this measurement result and um, this ensemble average uh, quantum information of the post-selected density matrices here. But if we take care of all that um, and look at the QFI, we can go to the large squeezing limit. And in that case, we saw that the result out here is almost pure. Um, and if we can apply a correction to this state, which depends on this measurement result, we can get an almost pure state, which is generated by a cur, cur which depends on this theta. So the, um, essentially we end up with super Heisenberg with a quantum Fisher information that depends, that goes as n bar cubed. So in some way, what we've done is we've taken this angle theta 
and we've essentially made a Kerr rotation whose strength depends on theta. And we can estimate that strength with n bar cubed fissure information. So we went through the uh, numerics to work it all out. And here is the quantum fissure information with the, um, the average photon number of the probe on the probe mode. And uh, it scales most of the time bigger than two. So this is the exponent the scaling. Less than two, it's uh, less than Heis Heisenberg limit is two. So most of the time it's bigger than two. So it seems to work. So I kind of run out of time. So it's an interesting circuit that we found. Essentially, we are able to teleport the, uh, a sort of nonlinearity into this probe mode to build up a curve rotation. So that's on the archive. And thanks very much. This is the group now in Okinawa. That's the beach out there. So if you want to come visit after COVID is over, yeah, please come visit. That's it. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks very much, Jason. So, um, yeah, so that, that's a very nice talk. Yeah, Jason. So, so one of the things which was a, a really bit uh, sad for me, unfortunately, is one of my undergrad students had also started to look exactly at this, uh, you know, the rotational thing problem, but he, he is still far behind. So in, in the sense that he started looking around November and stuff and just has some phases and things. So we, and we don't have a mechanism to create the superposition either. Uh, but anyway, it's it's very interesting. Um, so um, so anyway, going back to that slide, you know, regarding the rotational superpositions. Um, so I think the point Anupam was mentioning. Uh, so so you will have uh, the, the 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 distance between the between the two. Two, uh, two masses, have you also taken that to be L, right? Around L or something like that? No, no, no. it's tiny. So, so there will be this R, this R, there will be a one by, you know, the, so th that, that it, it will be the, you know, it will be like a curvature term, which entangles, you see, because there are two masses here. So it's, it will be, uh, there will be a kind of L square by R, uh, R cube, I thought. Um, but anyway, I'll. Okay, I, yeah, we can share about that. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I don't have the, the numbers in front of me. So this guy has done something, but there is essentially because there are two masses, is the second, is the next order thing which uh, entangles. But but it still, still can be large, I, I guess, if, if you're as close as they are uh, separated. It can right? never be large, but maybe yeah, so these are very. And yeah. we can discuss yeah. that. It can never be large. It will be a very tiny effect because it's like Earth Sun rotation effect. Oh, okay. So that's okay. a Kepler yeah. coil. The, 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 here, the dis yeah, the distances are very small. You see here. So, um, uh, but anyway, it's yeah, it's it's uh, interesting to see this. Yeah. So this guy was actually in the talk, but I think he has has gone out now. So I cannot uh, ask him uh, to show. He he went away halfway. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, the other thing I had to ask was um, during this, um, the last part, for the last part. <clears throat> so so, so uh, this, uh, uh, this is more of like a background question. So, so people, there, there's something that people say that Heisenberg scaling is the fundamentally the best achievable, right? Uh, yep. Do you know the answer to that? How you have this uh, n cubed? Um, so, uh, so um, it all depends what you mean by Heisenberg. Right. Okay. So what we're taking as the resource here is the photon number in this mode. Hmm. Right. So um, right. if if this is in in a practical circumstance, it might take a bit of time, make of effort to do this, but we're going to change the coherent state amplitude on this one. Mm -hmm. So it has I, a different scaling on that. So people will say, let's imagine we take the, the Hamiltonian to describe this whole circuit into until stage five. Let's consider that to be the whole 
yeah. So I think the uh, the Heisenberg, if you go to the full generality of saying, yeah, the Heisenberg limit is if you take absolutely everything into account, yeah, that's the that's the limit. But in practical circumstances, if I want to say, I want to only vary the photon number going to this mode, how does that scale? I want that scaled as fast as possible to get as big as possible, because I want mm -hmm. to, that's the only thing I'm going to be able to vary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see, I see. Okay. And in, in terms of resources that this conditioning on some outcome, right? That that doesn't, it's, it's throwing away like, is it throwing away any part of the yeah resource? so if you don't if you don't this if you don't do this correction nothing works hmm. yeah if you just throw everything away you know you don't get you get sub you get sub shot noise precision. okay even worse okay okay yeah even worse. worse yeah you have to do this correction okay okay thank you very much mm -hmm. Uh, I think every, everyone will have a lot of questions. So I already see raised hands from both Henrik and Gavin. Yeah, so Gavin, yeah. So, Gavin has been uh, waiting for to ask a question. Go ahead, Gavin. Ah, okay, okay. So Gavin, please. Yeah. Hi, Jason. Great stuff. Thanks. Um, nice talk. Um, can I ask about the work on the magnetically levitated uh, diamond? Oh yeah, sure. So you showed this some. Um, PSD and yeah, this slide, yeah. So it looks like the, is it right that as the pressure is going down, then the temperature initially goes up, but then it goes down? Is that, yeah, is that just... I don't know. We don't know why. We don't know why. Maybe there was some graphite that burned off it. I don't know. We didn't, we, uh, we, we've no idea why, why that went down. Yeah, no, I don't. I wouldn't know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> don't know, but we do know why the frequency changes. You notice also this frequency is changing, the trap frequency. Maybe mass uh, changing. Yeah, so we know why that happens, which is kind because of because if you change the like temperature goes up, maybe diamond will shift some mass, and it no, will be smaller. No, uh, so the magnetic susceptibility of diamond increases with higher temperature. No, no, the, the ma actual mass. No, I don't think so. All right. No, no, we could, we could reproduce the, re we, we could reproduce this. So we could just change the intensity of the light and it would go up and down, up and down. So Jason, so were you saying that the frequency was changing because of the magnetic susceptibility or because of the gas damping? So, so as you change the temperature of the diamond up and down, the magnetic susceptibility changes. Yeah, yeah, sure. And so you adjusting, just, just turn up the temperature by increasing the light. And uh, yeah, it goes higher in frequency and you just bring it down, it goes lower in frequency, up and down. You can just keep on doing that. Cool, thanks. I have a practical question. When do you think that you can uh, really uh, make this experiment and uh, give a number uh, that's uh, okay, the, the uh, quantum gravity effect is less than something, at least an upper limit or lower limit, something like that? Who's that? Who, who was that? Yeah, I think the person who did the question is uh, Hori. Yeah, she's uh, one of the. Um, I, I don't know. Um, so that, that, that pendulum talk I gave, that, that little talk, that was a theory talk. Um, so I don't know. Okay. But maybe some of the other people in the audience might. I think there's a lot of work trying to, to get towards this. So I would expect in the next 10 years. Soon as it's Thank, you. Thank you. I think uh, Henrik had a question. Yungshik had a question. Yeah, so Henrik, maybe. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, uh, yeah, great talk, Jason. Thanks a lot for, for that. Uh, interesting stuff. Lots of um, common interest. Um, on, on the uh, angular superposition, um, mm -hmm. so maybe maybe just a comment. So I think it is exactly right um, in regards of Munchik's question 
um, that because it is like in the liberation mode, right? So it's just a pendulum motion in a, in a way. It is, it is still in harmonic oscillator. So it's not like in a free rotation where it is a, a different, let's say mathematical model to describe. So, you know, as long as you have like really small, um, you know, amplitudes of this, of this uh, oscillation motion, it is the harmonic oscillator and you can use basically all the mathematics um, yeah. um, you know, uh, you know, for, for the harmonic oscillator. So that is that is fine. Um, we, we did a very similar study, so we didn't didn't look at uh, the entanglement idea, but we we just looked at the single um, liberation motion um, uh, angular superposition and how to do it, and if there's a gravity effect in there. And we find very similar numbers to to yours. So that is uh, you know very satisfying and <laughs> gives some confidence. I, I actually think these these uh, you know rotational angular superposition things are very interesting. Um, and I think that, you know, from an experimental point of view, um, you know, the best at the moment uh, to, you know, most realistic to actually do it in an experiment. Yeah? So, you know, you push down in mass and then at some point you will be able to, to do superpositions. Of course, you have to look in, into all of these, uh, you know, decoherence mechanisms, the usual ones. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that that's the right way to go. Yeah? I, I, I fully, fully agree. And, on that one. and I, I find it interesting that people can measure down to femtoradians. radians. Yes, femto yeah, radians. yeah. That, that's, that's one of the cool things. And I mean, Cavendish, he was a very clever man, right? He, he knew that if you, if you have rotation in the game, you can measure many things, uh, you know, more precise than for linear motion, right? Mm -hmm. um, for, the, for the gravity entanglement, maybe, you know, just my, let's say, the picture I have in mind in respect to Anupam's comment about it is like, you know, Sun Earth. I, I don't think that is the right picture. It is more like in, in the linear case, which we worked out, you know, many of us together. It is basically you have two masses, right? And now, um, you know, the, the, let's say the motion of these two masses is not controlled in a linear way, but by rotations. But the rotations are so small that I think for, you know, the these two masses, when they when they start to interact gravitationally, it is it is um, you know almost you know like in in the linear case, yeah. So it is not that. Um, no, no, I don't you know, agree, like, uh, Henrik. I don't agree with it, but we can like discuss this. later. I, I don't agree with it, uh, and we can discuss okay. later because as soon as you allow this to move, then essentially you are uh, triggering your angular momentum, and as soon as you bring in angular momentum, the factor L over R cube should come in. So. Uh, you can avoid that. If you say that if it's linear, then it becomes linear. As you said in the free, your first comment was correct. If it's purely linear, then what you are saying is absolutely correct. But if you allow it to slight rotation, then things will change. Okay. This is, this is the point. Well, I mean, I mean in, I, I'm in nowhere prepared to have like a proper discussion on this. It's just my, my more yeah. my intuition. No, no, that's okay. I mean, it's a textbook thing, so you can go and revise yeah. it. <laughs> yes. I mean, I mean, so so my my UG also did a few few estimates, right? So in in, in some sense, we were looking at also the paper by, uh, you know, uh, 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 Carleso and and you for, for the, yeah. the, that kind of option was there, but two such things, mm -hmm. right? But so yeah, so there there is an effect, so as as Jason showed, there there is an effect. But but I think it's 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 also important to emphasize these angular superpositions rather than rotational superpositions. Yes. So, so I think Anupam is also thinking of full rotations. I'm right? I'm thinking there of is, even a slight rotation. Like angular tilts. Yeah, yeah. This is like an angular superposition. Hmm. So if it is purely okay, so that was, that was, Purely yeah. uh, linear, then what Henrik is saying and, and what uh, Jason says is absolutely correct. I have no uh, objection on that. If you have okay. just how many uh, things. My, my second comment or, or question was uh, on the, the your last topic, the um, you know um, uh, mm -hmm. sensing, acceleration sensing, force sensing, magnetometers. Um, so so that is that is very cool stuff, very interesting. Um, I'm I'm also learning this at the moment, and I'm uh, you know I'm still still not not sure um, if if I fully get it, um, you know SQL and Heisenberg limit and what that actually is, and I, what I discover is that in different communities, so for instance in in the NMR um, spectroscopist community, they work based they, when when they grow up, uh, basically they 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 know SQL and Heisenberg and they use it every day, but I have the feeling that they mean something very different. Um, so, um, 
my question is maybe that one. Um, if you think, I mean, you, you talked about using uh, basically, you know, quantum optics, quantum information strategies um, to increase, uh, you know, the precision and measurement. So you use quantum Fisher information, you use state estimation and these kind of things to, you know, get like a, a super scaling uh, in, in, in the experiment. Um, what is like, you know, fundamentally from, from a physics point of view, what, what is like the, the reason that you maybe can beat these limits? Is, is there like, an, like a simple answer to this? Oh. <laughs> uh, mm. Mm. I'm not sure there is. I don't know of one. I don't know of a simple answer. Okay. So, and I don't think many people do because there's, as I said, there's very, very little stuff on metrology using nonlinear quantum systems. Um, so, yeah, I don't think there is a, such a simple answer. So I, 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 I can tell you why I asked this question. So we have, we have done this, you know, um, a Meissner levitation experiments where you have a ring and then you have a permanent magnet sitting on top of it. Um, and um, so we haven't not done like the experiment where we really measure, uh, let's say a magnetic field or a gravitational field, but we have just used the force noise. So we know basically the parameters of our harmonic oscillator. So we know the quality factor, we know the temperature, we, we know the frequency and the mass, and then we can estimate what is the minimum force we can measure yeah, in this typical uh, force noise approach. Um, and what we find is that we, can, we should be able to measure magnetic fields, which are uh, by two or three orders of magnitude below the standard quantum limit. Yeah? Um, and then, um, you know, Dimitri Budka, they did very similar experiments and they, they found the same thing. Um, uh, now the question is why? And I think it has something to do with, with correlations, right? So, I mean, um, if, if you say the standard quantum limit, for instance, that, that is basically coming from Heisenberg's uncertainty relation. So, you know, if, if you use, um, you know, again, the harmonic oscillator, you have uh, delta X, delta P, and that there's a limit on how precise you can measure both at the same time. Uh, but that is for the case where, where position and momentum are not correlated, right? As soon as you have correlation between the two, you can, you know, go beyond those limits. And my feeling is that at least in, in the system where we have done the experiment, um, that is what's happening yeah? in, in a way which is not yet clear. I mean, we do no state preparation. We do, we do no squeezing. We do none of these, um, these kind of things, yeah? but, but still it turns out to be like a very, very precise, uh, you know, force sensor. Yeah. I don't know, maybe it is not really related to, to the things you, 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 are, you are thinking about, but um, yeah. Well, uh, so I know there's other experiments which are back action evading you experiments. So when you make a measurement, the noise is put onto a different degree of freedom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, usually that's kind of hard to manage to do. Hmm. So I don't know. It sounds what you're what you're describing sounds pretty interesting. I don't know how it's below the SQL. Maybe it's a different type of I don't know. Yeah. Nick, is, is it due to like uh, many spins are, are kind of coupled together? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's that that is that is what we're thinking at the moment is that because it's a ferromagnet and you have basically spins exactly, yeah. which are polarized. Um, yeah. Somehow there's the answer to, to that question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, anyway, that was just, just me. Uh, great talk, thanks a lot. But uh, the paper that, so, so but Hendrik, the, uh, the question of the accuracy, is that published somewhere? Can we read it? Uh, yeah, I, I can send you the link that's in the, in the latest, what is it, physical review research. I think it is on the magnetic levitation. I, I can send you the link uh, later. Yeah. So I think Mushik has a question as well. Uh, yes, uh, it's yeah, it's interesting. Uh, thank you very much, um, Jason, for this talk. Um, my, it's not question. It's just you're the last part. Um, N squared. I think. Um, the uh, uh, our so 
some time ago, uh, I, 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 I was involved in a paper with uh, Igor Pikovsky about uh, the commutation relation. And the, uh, if we can have this uh, n squared dependence uh, by um, the geometric phase thing. Uh, and the U, uh, the integral of the linear form going into the oh, uh, mean, quadratic form, in fact, also, it, it, this in fact is, is, is in Sugato's paper with Peter Knight as well. Uh, so uh, eventually this, uh, by uh, the taking it for a long time, uh, uh, the interaction for a long time for this uh, mechanical oscillator, interacting with the photon, then uh, the, uh, at some stage it becomes uh, the n-square dependence like self-car. Uh, I, I, I wonder if it makes sense, but anyways, uh, that's your, your, so this, the, the last, uh, the, the equation in this slide reminds me mm. of that. Mm. Yeah, so it's great. We, we actually showed how to do it for any B here. So yeah. So it doesn't have to be N to get N squared. It could be anything else if we can square it. Okay, right, yeah. This is good, yeah. Thanks, Major. Yeah. And also the, uh, in, in relation to what uh, the Sugato said, I mean, uh, asked, uh, the uh, Heisenberg limit. Yeah, I, I also have a very uh, big question uh, about the meaning of Heisenberg limit because it sometimes it doesn't really make sense. And so uh, if there is a, the uh, physical system for the super Heisenberg limit, uh, uh, the uh, sensitivity, I'm not surprised. I'm not saying that it is uh, not interesting. It is very interesting result, but it is yeah. not against the uh, basic, uh, the physical principle. That's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. okay. Cool. So, um, yeah, Jason, maybe maybe one um, uh, last question uh, on uh, you know on, on um, the general trapping aspects of. So you said you have some uh, anharmonicities, right? You still see in your trapping, right? Um, do you know where they are? coming from because uh, these two pole pieces, they are making a harmonic oh, yeah. track, right? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, let me show you. Okay. Well, okay, these are the, 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 the tips of the two magnets. I mean, in this picture, I've drawn them as lovely points, but they're not. Mm, I see. They're, they're not really points. I see, I see. I so see. it's not really. Right, right, right. I see. So there are like few wells and stuff connected. Yeah, by there's a few wells. And every now and then we would see this guy go over to this, then maybe oh. over to here. Oh, oh yeah. Right, right. And is, is this like a fundamental, can people do better structures now? Or, or I mean, is, is that- I don't know, huge? I don't know, maybe. Okay. I don't know. But um, yeah, but I think once you get down to, um, I think many people have seen, I think uh, also Brian Urso has also seen anharmonicity oh. at, at, at the lower levels when you get down to very low pressures. So I think it'll be a common problem. How to spatially engineer your, your traps to be okay. good. Okay, thank you. And, and last but not the least, one, one question is that in, in, your, in your method of creating these angular superpositions, like a double well kind of method, right? So usually tunneling doesn't work very well, right? For, for large masses. But somehow, in your case, still um, uh, by being, um, you know, maybe because of the small angles, I don't know, it seems to be working, right? Is, is there, 
Is there any contradiction with the large mass tunneling across uh, potential with, with what you're doing? Or you, you probably don't need that. Uh, yeah, so what we do is we we have this, what do you call it, a shortcut with the Ali Ah, that's true. Okay, okay. So okay. we're controlling very carefully how the, the potential is being built. Oh. Right, right, right. So, so you're kind of dynamically generating this. Uh, so, so have you have you put all the decoherences in when you're generating this? Oh, no, sort of no, there's no decoherence okay. anywhere. Okay, okay, I see. It's so, hard so. enough to get the superposition. Mm, that's true, okay. okay. Well, uh, I see. After that, okay. we can, next paper right. could be the uh, decoherence, but it's I see. hard enough to, to generate okay. the, the split in the okay. beginning. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, yeah. Um, yeah, so if, if uh, no other questions, let us uh, thank Jason. So Jason, by the way, also some of the early things were very nice. Yeah, the, 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 so we like, I, I like those demonstrations also of the, 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 the aluminum refined for, for the magnetron. Okay, bye, bye for today. Bye. Thank you, bye. bye.